Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at Mao Ying's skill tree in Total War Warhammer 3. Now this will be the first of many skill tree guides for Warhammer 3, and we're starting with Mao Ying simply because I'm currently playing a Mao Ying campaign. But the general plan moving forward for the skill tree guide is that we will always first introduce the structure of the skill tree in terms of what each role does for the character, how many total skill points there are, how many you have access to, and some of the give and take as we'll explore each individual skill as well as their level up and talk about their merits. And we'll recommend sort of a guide to approaching how to pick your skills for certain characters, what makes the character strong, what makes them unique, and things you should consider when building out your character for Total War Warhammer 3. Now, to kick things off, there are 98 possible skill upgrades on Mao Ying's tree here, and divided into what I would like to call six roles. Uh, first role is kind of simplified, there's only two things, and then we have the second row here, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And since the max level for Legendary Lords in Warhammer 3 is 50, and we start with level 1 with no skills checked, that means we'll have 49 skill points to use on this skill tree. So exactly half of these skills can be picked for any given build. So it's pretty important to know what you're doing as you approach this tree to not waste your skill points on things later on that you might not need. Of course, you can rely on mods to respec your characters, but assuming we're playing on vanilla and there is no respecking and there is no access to more than the 49 standard skill points, this is what this guide is meant to do. So let's first introduce the roles. Uh, usually, this is the case for pretty much every single character in the game. You have the first role here, which usually deals with your mounts, special faction-wide bonuses related to your general faction your, general, your legendary lord belongs to. In this case, for Mao Ying, we have very little bonuses at the top. We have Win Harmony and Range Discipline, and that's it. And the reason here is there is no mounts for Grand Cathay Dragon Lords, because they transform themselves into a dragon. They don't ride anything. So it's very simplified. This is not going to be the case for every character, but for us, being Grand Cathay, being a Dragon Lord, this is the case. In the future, if we get diversified uh, Legendary Lord added for Grand Cathay and DLCs, I expect us to see a bit more fleshed out for this row up here. For example, if we get the Monkey King, which I think we will, I pray. I pray they have some sort of Nimbus Cloud as a mount uh, for the Monkey King, because that would be awesome. But uh, we'll see if that happens. Then the second role is usually designed specialized for legendary lords. In our case, we have something called Aurora of Majesty, which kicks things off. You can see the arrows and then a certain box uh, defining a group of skills and then linking to another skill, which basically require you to pick up something from the prior uh, grouping or a single skill. This one will unlock at rank 12, and these skills are very unique to your legendary lord, and they will define the playstyle. Almost always, this role is probably the most powerful skill choices you have on your legendary lord, and are definitely skills you should consider. Now don't worry, we're glancing through these because I'm just generalizing what each role mean for the skill tree. We'll come back and look at everything carefully. And then the third row here, starting with hard to hit, is a row of bonuses that is added to the stats of your character. So in this case, we have melee defense, charge bonus, armor, hit point, melee attack, and so forth. Uh, Sometimes it's a ability added to your character to boost your stats. And pretty much everything in the third role is to add to the power of your legendary lord in combat. Then the fourth role is access to spells for your uh, legendary lord. In this case, we have earth blood to kick things off we have access to uh, the lore of in which includes the lore of life so we are a powerful healer uh, there are also some shadow abilities that will deal damage like later on we have talent of the night and we'll obviously look at everything and it will always end with something that's earthling magical reserves into arcane conduit uh, basically giving us power recharge during battle to pick up more 
uh, winds of magic to dish out more spells and so forth. So this is sort of your spell roll. And then moving down, starting with Inspiring Presence, we have a role that deals with your troops in your army. So starts off with giving experience and increase your Aurora's leadership effect. Basically, units near your legendary lord will feel encouraged and receive five additional points of leadership. And then you have categories of unit type. So this would be your melee infantry. This will be your missile infantry. This will be your gunpowder units. This will be your cavalry. These will be your single entities, your terracotta sentinels, your Wuxing war compasses, and finally your sky lantern and sky junk units. And then you can pick up something called rally. It's an active ability that boosts nearby units. And then you have more specialized bonuses. So this would be bonuses for charge bonus and leadership on your melee infantry. This will be faster reload time and missile resistance for all your range unit aside from the sky junks. And Sky Lantern, this will be for all your cavalry as well as your big single entity by giving them more speed and physical resistance. And this is bonuses for your Lantern units. And finally, you can upgrade Rally to something that gives additional melee defense on top of leadership. And since this is our first skill tree guide, I will also describe what the stats uh, do in game to kind of make sense of everything. In future skill tree guides, we'll be skipping that part. I will have a separate guide just for the stats and how it works in Warhammer 3, because I realize a lot of my audience in particular comes from Three Kingdoms, where the stats are treated a little bit differently uh, versus, say, Troy and Warhammer, which uses a different engine, and we have melee attack and melee defense instead of just having an evasion stat. And I'll kind of explain everything as we go. Finally, the last row, the sixth row here, always starts out with Route Marcher, which is lovely, gives you campaign movement range. And then it moves on to more of a campaign map bonus. So things like providing local control, cheaper recruitment, uh, less attrition, which can be fairly useful if you plan on traveling through some heavy attrition land, since we are dealing with corruption. And then you can also reduce corruption, leading to a Lord bonus, which is interesting because this means your Lord can actually heal up 30% casualty replenishment rate uh, just for your Lord army. So just your Lord heals faster and less wound recovery time in case they do get knocked out. Legendary Lords can't die and therefore they go down and become wounded for five turns and come back. This way they're wounded for four turns and come back a little quicker. And then more campaign bonuses. So we have Lightning Strike, which allows for eventually uh, Lightning Strike battles where reinforcements are blocked out, similar to Night Battles in Three Kingdoms except for you're not fighting during the night. And before you upgrade all the way to tier three, you have access to just lengthening the time it requires for enemy reinforcements to show up uh, as a weaker version of lightning strike battles where they just can't show up. And then we have upkeep, we have casualty replenishment, we have ambush defense. So all sorts of campaign map army boost, ending with some sort of special boost related to your faction, in our case, the great Bastion, it's still more campaign map related. We have upkeep, we have starting recruitment rank, we have plus two local recruitment capacity, right? So let's take a look at everything in detail and discuss how we should approach building our character. So first things first, Mao Ying is a good spellcaster. She has access at the beginning. This is level one, no skills, two basic skills, earth blood, which is probably the most powerful skill in my opinion that she has access to and Storm of Shadows. These skills can be improved by clicking additional skill points in them. So you can see Earthbloods here. We technically haven't learned it, but somehow we have access to it. The reason being is the points gives improvement to the current spell. So we can see here if we get the level one Earthblood, we'll reduce the Earthblood cooldown by 30%. Right now it's 30 seconds, so that's going to turn to 21 seconds. And we gain access to something called an overcast spell that's called Earthblood Upgraded. Overcast in Warhammer 3 and Warhammer in general is when you click on the spell twice when you're casting and you get a more powerful version of the spell. It will always work, but there's a chance of miscast. As you can see here, there's a miscast chance of 50%. And what that means is there's a chance that your caster will hit backfired and lose a bit of health casting this overpowered spell. So overclocking gone wrong. 
Uh, but if you're desperate for some powerful effect and you don't mind losing health on the character casting, it is totally fine. Now, this miscast percentage can go down. So it's 50 right now. If we get level 2, you can see that the cooldown on the basic spell goes down by 50% now. So only 15 second cooldown. And then the cost will also go down. In the top right corner, we have 8 right now. Uh, that is the cost of using uh, Earth Blood, uh, Winds of Magic cost, and that will go down by two. So think of that as just mana usage. And the overcast cost, which is additional cost, will go down by three, and the miscast will go down by 15% to 35%, which you can see here. And the shared spell tree here, skills, earthing later on, uh, will give farther reductions to miscast base chance. So that brings us to 20%. And there are plenty of items you can equip on your legendary lore that will reduce the final 20% miscast. So if you like to overcast, that's definitely an approach you should do. Uh, me personally, I don't see that much of a benefit for overcasting often. Uh, I prefer to just spam the basic version, especially for something that's such a short cooldown with Earth Blood, and it saves plenty of. Uh, skill points as well since we don't have the luxury of picking everything since we can only get half So that is our basic spell that we start off and you can see storm of shadow can also be upgraded in a similar fashion So that's just the clarification of the spells having multiple points So just to do things in order. We'll start from the top Wind harmony range discipline both of these are available at rank 7 and their effects are rather straightforward spell resistant 10% missile resistant 10% this means when you're hit by a missile attack, something ranged, and this means something that's a magical spell, the damage done to you will be reduced by 10%. Very straightforward. Are they good? Mm, they're not bad. Are they worth a skill point? Well, it depends on what you have to give up. So my judgment on these is you don't have to rush for them. I don't think they're extremely good compared to what else you can spend your points on. I know you might think 49 points is a lot of points and you should you know, definitely consider these, but I still think there are more good things on this tree than you think. Then moving on to the second roll. The first skill here, Aurora of Majesty, becomes unlocked at rank 12. This is quite key because of how powerful this entire roll is. After the first one becomes unlocked, everything else that follows becomes unlocked. There's no more rank cap to it. So I prefer to actually save skill points before rank 12 so that once I hit 12, I can snatch up as many as these as I want. And usually I save anywhere from six to seven points. So that means starting from rank six or rank five, you stop using your points and just end turn until you hit rank 12. You're giving up some early power elsewhere, but this is in my opinion, a really good way to approach your campaign because there's nothing else that early that can make a huge difference. Even in the first four rank up, using just those four points that you have, you can get a pretty powerful character and you can save the remaining points, the seven points or so, uh, for your Aurora Majesty without really damaging your campaign. So why is this good? First up, this is a dragon form passive ability means once we are transformed to a dragon, this becomes automatically activated and essentially makes Mel Ying a good duelist against enemy lords or heroes. And particularly when you're in dragon form, because when you're in dragon form, you apply this debuff to nearby enemy lord and hero, assuming they're within 35 meters, which they should if you're dueling them, and it reduces their melee defense by nine points. Now, what is melee defense? Let's talk about this right now even though pulley would make a little bit more sense when we talk about personal stats. But right now, the simple version is that is your evasion percentage. So he's going to dodge 9% less, and you're going to hit 9% more. That's the easy version here. And we'll talk about the more complicated math when we talk about the actual stats and how we pick between these. So this is pretty good if you want to duel with your general in dragon form, and that is usually a good plan. The dragon form is really good at taking out towers, so for minor and major siege battles, having Mel Ying in dragon form, running up to a tower, destroying it, flying into the enemy base, finding their lord, landing and killing them in dragon form, this is a great option. And then we have Harmonious. 
20 points of diplomatic relations with all Cafe factions. This is great for trying to confederate with them, trying to trade with them, signing all sorts of treaties with them to get money, mainly to confederate with them. Because I don't know if you play like me, but my dream is to confederate all of Grand Cafe. Certainly, you can be super efficient and just play with one or two provinces with one army or two army for the entire game and just wait for those portals, get your soul, win the campaign condition. But I think that's boring. I want to rule all of Grand Cafe, and to do so, I need better relations with all the Grand Cafe faction, and Harmonious is going to do that. On top of it, wherever Mao Ying is standing, we get two points of control and minus one corruption, just a sweet little bonus on top. So I think this is a must-have. Reinforce Bastion. This reduces the construction cost of all Grand Bastion buildings by 40%, and this is one that I typically skip. Not that it's not great. There are three gates. Each gate has four building slots, which includes your main gate building, going from tier 1 to tier 5. The other three slots, usually I tend to build the growth building, which is really good because eventually at tier 5, it gives faction-wide growth bonuses, so it's an excellent choice there. It's very well designed. It gives local growth until tier 5, because once you hit tier 5, you don't need any more growth in local region, so that's excellent design. And then the other two slots, there are a lot of options and combinations, so I'm not going to say anything is in particularly good, but in essence, you're going to end up building four buildings at each of the Grand Bastion locations, the gates in total 12 slots, and it's going to cost you quite a bit of money. There is the Harmony discount of 20% faction-wide if you can maintain Harmony. There is an edict at each, well, commandment, let's call them what they are. They are edicts, but they're also commandments. Basically, if you own the whole province, and each of the gate is an entire province. So once you control a single gate, you can set the edict. There is one that gives growth and 20% discount. So you're ready naturally at minus 40% discount for all your Grand Bastion building, assuming you can keep your harmony, assuming you can use the right edict once you control the province. And now if you get this, you get up to 80% discount for the building. Extremely cheap. And that's fine. But to me, money is basically terms, right? Do I really care that I'm saving another 40% when I really don't need that money? Right? The cash you spend on buildings, especially defensive buildings at the Grand Bastion, is just money out of the window. It's not going to return any money, so building it faster doesn't get you any better. It's just surplus money. So if I have to wait an extra turn to build something, it's not going to kill my campaign. But losing a skill point, that's much more valuable because I only have 49 points. So this is one that I skip. And then we have Master of the Storm. This is interesting. This is the one that I think is slightly optional, depends on how you play the game. If you like to overcast, which tend to be more of a late game usage because you want things like earthing, you don't want to miscast all the time, this can wait, right? If I'm saving skill points for rank 12, these two are the two that I might not account for. Do I want minus 25% cooldown to lore of life spell? Yes, because earth blood is really good if I get a full upgrade. 50% cooldown and then add another 25% cooldown, that's incredible. I'm only gonna, you know, have about 8 seconds, 7.5 second cooldown in between Earth Blood usage. Uh, that's insane because with each cast, I also get uh, 5 seconds of regeneration. So basically, there's like a 2 second cooldown when my units are not healing on the field, and that's just kind of crazy. Uh, so this is great, and you see all the discounts for Winds of Magic spell for the three spells that are Lore of Life spells. If you're confused about what is Lore of Life spell, it tells you right here, Earth Blood, Flush to Stone, and Regrowth. But they're all discounts to the upgraded version, which means you have to overcast to take advantage of this. So if you are rank 12, you don't need this one. If you are rank 49, this is great, right? If you have everything set up and you are ready to use, a lot of your overcast spells, then pick this one up. But in the beginning, when you're saving points for when you hit rank 12, this is not one you need. You don't need the Earth Blood cooldown to be this slow. You don't have fast enough recharge of Winds of Magic to fully utilize that. You want to get Arcane Conduit uh, before you shorten your cooldown to that extreme level. And then we have Oppressor of Chaos. This is something you should get right away. 
Not only do you get 10 points of melee defense, which is evasion chance, when you're fighting Norska, Warriors of Chaos, Demons of Chaos, so pretty much everything that come from north of the Grand Bastion. So you'd be fighting a ton of these guys, and you get 10 points more evasion, and 4% ward save. Ward save is just straight up damage resistance. So every single unit within Mel Ying's army will be reducing 4% damage when fighting against these three types of factions. Not just three factions, three types of factions. So all Norska factions, all Warrior of Chaos faction, and all Demon factions. So this is excellent, must have at rank 12. 10% additional range for all your missile units. Must have for Mel Ying, who has a default 20% ammo boost for all missile units, as well as 50% upkeep discount for all missile infantry in her own army. Persistent fire, reload reduction by 20%. This is excellent. There's other forms of reload we've seen with the unit boost. There is the in yang, in battle harmony, which increases your reload time, or reload skill, which reduces reload time as well. And you can get something like your artillery to sub five second cooldown in between each shot, which is just ridiculous. That's when you start thinking no amount of ammo boost is enough to not fire out all your shots. Uh, so this is great. All these are wonderful. And finally, we pick up Eye of the Storm. This is once again a dragon form ability, and this will increase your base weapon damage and your armor piercing damage when in dragon form by another 50%. Increase your melee attack by 24, which essentially increase your hit rate by 24% against the enemy for 29 seconds. So combine this with Aurora Majesty, fly in in dragon form, kill the enemy lord. That's exactly what this is designed for. So this is your enemy hero sniping Malian build is central for that. Uh, and you want to pick up basically one, two, three, four, five, six skills when you hit rank 12. So plan for that. Then moving down, we have our stats, and this is where we're going to talk about our stats just this once. Uh, in the future, we'll have a separate you know, uh, guide for just stat talk, uh, but just for those who are coming from uh, no Warhammer background, uh, this will help you out a lot. So first, we have melee defense plus five. This is excellent, by the way. Uh, of all the stats, I think melee defense is the best stat to add in almost all instances. And how this works is you have melee attack and melee defense. They sound like the same thing, but they don't interact with each other. So in essence, we will always take our melee attack, add 35 to it, and subtract the enemy melee defense. And vice versa, the enemy melee attack plus 35 minus our melee defense. And that determines our hit rate. This is a very different concept than Three Kingdoms. Three Kingdom is you have an evasion stat. The enemy always hits for 100%, subtracting your evasion stat, right? That's easier to understand. Here is there is a default buffer of 35 points. It's added to your melee attack. So for example, we have 65 right now. Our melee attack plus the buffer amount 35 will be at 100. If the enemy have 55 melee defense, I subtract that. I have 45. My hit chance is 45%, right? So technically, if you can get this value melee attack way high, Let's say if this is um, 100, for example, somehow, right? And you add 35 to it, and enemy only has 35 melee defense, every single attack is going to hit. That's how melee attack and melee defense work. So why do I like melee defense? Well, the more you have, it's a straight reduction of enemy hit chance. If you're fighting some random mob unit as your legendary lord, and the random mob unit only has something like 25 melee attack which is not hard to find. Uh, plenty of uh, basic mob units have only 25, and you add 25 to, uh, 35 to them, there are 60. You're 60, they can't hit you. You take no damage, right? If you evade the attack, you don't even have to worry about armor and armor piercing damage and base weapon damage. They just can't hit you. So if you have a chance to improve your melee defense, excellent. Now there's other intricacies here, they charge at you, their charge bonus get added to their melee attack for the 7 seconds, decreasing during the time. They're able to damage you, of course, it's not just, you know, in the sustained fight, you take no damage. There's also things like debuffs, there's also things like AI difficulty cheating, right? They get like 10%, so 10 points of extra melee attack and extra melee defense that you just don't see on the stat when you play on legendary difficulty. Um, so there, there's 
minor things, but it's always better to increase your evasion chance because you don't have to worry about armor. Armor is secondary. Armor only comes into the picture once they actually hit you. And even then, it's not a one-to-one -one exchange. So getting that percentage dodge, best thing in my opinion. Uh, the one exception is when you're fighting against range. Range units don't care about melee defense. If you're getting hit by missile, getting hit by spells, you have to physically dodge with your model. The accuracy is what matters. When the missile damage hits you, it does not consider your melee defense. It's called melee defense, right? And then your armor kicks in, right? So that's things you have to consider. Of course, you can micro really well and dodge a lot of missile fire, especially with single entity lords. Uh, so that's something else to consider. But in general, if you're getting into the thick of things, you're fighting other lords up front with your you know, build here, having more melee defense, always great. Then we have this cluster of four bonuses, each with two levels. Charge increase, armor increase, we have health increase, and melee attack increase. And we need to pick at least four points to gain access to something called Foe Seeker, which is an active ability when you're in human form that gives you faster speed and vigor loss reduction, which is going to add up to 25%. So basically, fatigue reduction. And fatigue is a major factor that you really don't see in the game, but Essentially, when you're tired, you start losing stats all across the board. Melee attack goes down, melee defense goes down, speed goes down, and that's going to make you suffer. Uh, so if you can have any way of recovering your vigor or basically your fatigue level, uh, it's a very useful spell. And plus, it's an ability, so you can use this anytime. There's no winds of magic usage. Uh, just spam this on cooldown. It's never going to hurt you. So great thing to pick up. Now, the question is, because we want to be efficient with our skill point usage, we want to pick exactly four here. Which ones are most important? Well, charge bonus, as I mentioned, get added to your weapon strength, your melee attack, when you are performing a charge, right? When you right click a unit, you have enough space to kind of charge up a charge, you will get that. And once you land, it's seven seconds and it goes away. So that's something to consider. And you can replicate this with different bonuses if you're charging from the flank, from the rear flank, from the side flank, you get reductions on enemy melee defense in those situations. Uh, it's pretty complicated, but it's only good for seven seconds in essence, which is why I don't really advocate it. And plus charging in Warhammer, it's very different from charging in Three Kingdoms. Like you don't see a charge bonus of 500, uh, which is fairly common for cavalry in Three Kingdoms. So it's a different math and it's not as good. Armor. So we talked about how I like melee defense because you can just dodge the attack. Well, armor is a little bit different. Armor is when that attack actually hit, whether it's melee attack, whether it's physical weapon strength attack, melee attack, right? Melee or missile. When it hits you, you have to look at the damage type, base and armor piercing. First off, armor piercing would just come straight through because it pierces the armor. So in our case, if we hit someone, regardless whether armor value is, we'll always dish out 141 attack guaranteed. Why is there extra one? Because no matter how high your armor is, at least one base damage will go through. That is guaranteed. So for a lot of the really, really weak units, like Nobblers, like Peasant Spearmen, even if all their damage is on base and you're fighting some super heavily armored unit that you can't crack, at least one base damage will go through per attack. So that's something to keep in mind. For us, that's usually not a problem because our base damage is just sky high. And when your base damage is this high, armor is really kind of pointless because armor is not a percentage figure, it's just a shielding figure. So what I mean by that is you will get um, reduction here. So it's not 70 point to 70 points. You're not reducing it by 70%. You are essentially rolling a number between 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and one, whenever you're taking damage to see how much of your armor is being applied. So if I get really lucky and I roll one, for each individual attack, you have to do this random calculation you know, in the back uh, every time. So I'm getting whacked this time and I roll a one. That means my armor will get one to one ratio, 
right? So I will get 70 armor, full armor. I will be able to remove 70 of that, 70% um, of that damage away, right? So I am essentially going to erase 70% of 290, and that's that's awesome. But I can equally, equal like, equally likely roll a 0.5, and then my 70 armor essentially becomes 35 armor, and I can only remove 35% of that 290. And there's another chance of hitting 0.75. So on average, if you're having a long extended fight, you're going to be blocking off 0.75 times your armor percentage amount of base damage away from the enemy. That's how armor works. That's why you can see a unit with something like 130 armor and still taking damage because it's rolling like 0.5 and it only ends up being 65 armor. So each point of armor it's technically only giving you 0.75 of the value on average. So if I'm getting like 15 additional armor added here, I'm not actually getting a full 15%. I'm getting three uh, fourth of that, which is closer to 12% here. It's not bad, but I, I don't think it's as valuable as straight up melee defense. Unless you know for a fact that you're facing off against just a massive range army that just have all base damage too, because on top of that, if they have a lot of armor piercing damage, your armor is useless. It doesn't matter what you roll. The armor piercing damage is coming through. So that's all things to consider with armor. That's why I don't think it's as good. Then we have health. Health is pretty straightforward. We get more health, more hit point. But I think in addition to that, your max health also determines your cap to replenishment rate per battle. So you're, you have a healing cap every battle, and the healing cap is defined by your total health. Therefore, by improving our total health, being a healer, it's much better for us because our not only does our total health for that battle goes up, our total healing health for that battle also goes up. So it benefited us basically twice. So I prefer hit point. And then finally, melee attack. Melee attack is just the counter to enemy melee defense. If enemy melee defense is an important stat, then obviously having melee attack is an important stat for us. So. 12% additional hit chance for us, especially since we're interested in being a dueling dragon lord. So we'll pick up basically these four points here and then move on with Foe Seeker for that bonus. And once we have this, we have access to these four right here. And all we need is four points from this group before we can find the final one. And do we want the final one? Deadly Onslaught. Another augment ability when we're in human form, these can be only used, same thing here. These are human form bonuses. You want to switch between the two form, essentially. You fly in as a dragon, you do some damage, you take some damage, you change back to human form, recover some of your uh, fatigue, and then heal as well. Uh, you can't use your healing spell when you're in dragon form. So once you take some damage, you recover, and then you can continue to fight because there's a long cooldown in between transformations. So you still want to be capable when you're human form. So having something like Deadly Onslaught to increase your weapon base damage or armor piercing damage by 25% for 31 seconds, not bad. Charge bonus of 60% boost going from 50 here, the base, to additional 80 points total. Not terrible. Um, so this is a useful skill. So let's see where we want to put the four points. Well, first take this, Staunch Defender, 12 points of melee attack. We're going to explain why this is good. And it's only one point for basically two point worth of stats. That's the best part about it. We're saving skill points. And then the other three points, our options are speed, melee attack, and weapon strength. First off, melee attack is the best thing here. So get both points here. And then we're down to one point. Uh, that one point, it's really up to you. If you think just having some more raw weapon strength, I think you're right. I think Woundmaker is not bad, 10% boost. Let's pick that one. Speed is questionable because our base speed is quite low, 46. 7% isn't going to save us. It's three points, right? Three points of speed or 10% damage, 43 damage here. So 10% damage, I think, just wins. So one point here, two point here, one point here, pick up Deadly Onslaught. When should you pick these up? N not entire, not rushing these, I think. I think getting this at rank 12 is key, and then we're probably moving to spells. And then we're probably moving back to making our lord strong. And then we're probably moving on to units because you're not going to get your end game premium units early on. You need the settlement level to go up. You need your military buildings to be built. You need your economy to kick off. So early on, you're just going to have bad units. Rely on your spells. Rely on your character strength to carry you. 
and then you transition to having a good army later on. So this is probably the second most important thing. Well, this is the first. Spells are second. This is the third, making yourself very strong. Okay, so the spells, the second most important thing. Already have basic earth blood. Well, you definitely need to pick up the level up one because you want to get access to this box here. So one point here before the first six rank. Because we want to get power of in and life bloom as quickly as possible. These two are passive abilities that activate when you cast any spell. So when Malian casts Earth Blood, both of these will activate. And what they do is she will hex or basically debuff 55 meters around her. Enemy units will lose 15 points of armor and 10% speed. Just nice thing to have. And all your units map wide will heal 1% over 5 seconds. That's awesome. On top of the healing that Earth Blood will give in a 35 meter effective range, all units, your units inside this 35 meter for the next 14 seconds will heal 0.8% per second. Comes out to about, um, I uh, think it's 11.2% uh, health. This number can go up because if you have multiple spellcasters, we have something called Mastery of the Elemental Winds. They can increase the intensity of each spell. I think if you have two of these users, it goes up to 115%. And the 0.8% there goes up to like 0.92, and you can keep increasing if you put more spellcaster in the army. So it's it's a variable number, but it's just a decent amount of healing. So technically, each cast in this area, not only do you heal 11.2% using Earth Blood, you also heal 1% for everyone on top of that. So just keep spamming it. Now to get evasion, it takes five points here. So these two are must-haves, and you want to pick up these three early. Right before the rank 12 saving points here, you want to save six points. So somewhere around rank seven, you stop using points. But before rank seven, pick up your earth blood, pick up your power again, pick up your life bloom. And then we need three more points here before we can get evasion. And we have three separate spells with different upgrades. Now, Storm of Shadow is something that you already have. So technically, this is not a super powerful spell, but it's a pretty good trigger for life bloom and power of yin because there's only a uh, well, very cheap cost, right? The base spell here, you can see it only costs four. The base spell for this costs six, and it can be reduced by another another two points if you get the final one. So this will end up costing four as well. This, if you get the upgrade at the end, reduced by one, this will cost three wins of magic. So if all you're interested in is triggering these, these are great triggers. So you can definitely spend the two points here, but I don't think reducing a s enemy speed, you have to target a enemy area, right? And then you end up reducing their speed by 45%. It's not the most useful, like I can see a use for it because let's say you have a lot of range units, you want to buy time for them to get more shots out, then debuffing the enemy charge, pretty smart. Or if you're faced against a lot of range unit, you can use Missile Mirror and it actually redirects their projectile back at them for the next 36 seconds. So they're killing themselves. Um, it sounds great, but if you factor into how long reload time are for things like artillery, it's not going to do a lot of damage to them, maybe three, four rounds of shot, and you have to time it really well. Um, so not the greatest, but it's worth one point, in my opinion. Right? It could turn the battle around if you're faced against just maybe the Skaven settlement in the middle of Grand Cathay, which there are a bunch of, and they have one of those Skaven catapults. Use the spell. Shut it down. Don't have to worry about it. So that's worth getting at least a point. Flush to Stone, also worth getting points. I actually think the distribution here should be one point of Missile Mirror, two points of Storm Shadow. Uh, actually, no, sorry. Uh, one point of uh, Missile Mirror. Uh, this is optional because I think both of these are... If you're only getting two points here to get one second reduction, or one point reduction of the Winds of Magic on Storm or Shadow, it's really not worth it, right? I'm paying four, paying three. Not a big deal. So I would think I would just skip this because I already have this spell. I'll get one point of Missile Mirror and two points of Flesh to Stone because this is a Lore of Life spell. We get mastery from this, benefit it. If we end up enjoying Overcast, this is a great option to pick up. It costs quite a bit, but uh, it's very useful. Physical resistance on a single entity target for 60%. You can use this on yourself. So you fly in there, you duel for a little bit as Dragon, you come down, you want to change back to human form, you want to heal, you want to get back some of your fatigue factor, you want to give yourself some physical resistance when you're fighting the enemy, that's a great combo. 
So two points here, one point here, just to have this in case you want to shut down key target. Two points here for these two passive casting abilities. That's five points. Pick up evasion. Constant boost for self of 5% speed and five points of melee defense. We talked about how good melee defense is. Awesome ability. Moving on to the next grouping here. We need four points in this area. Uh, if you are thinking about using upgraded overcast abilities, you must pick up earthing because it takes a huge chunk of your miscast base chance away. Um, it's always nice to get power magical reserve because you can get increased power reserve by 20% when increasing. This opens up the ability to spam spells in battles by having more reserve wins of magic. This is a must have. Uh, if you already picked these because you're thinking about overcast, then you have two points left between regrowth and talent of night. So regrowth is a super powerful single entity heal that costs quite a bit because the duration is 29 seconds. The heal per second is 1.2% per second. You're actually healing around 43% of a single entity health back. So on things like Terracotta Sentinels, on things like Sky Junk, it's going to heal thousands and thousands of health and also recover all their vigor. So this is perfect to heal yourself if you're the only target that needs healing and also perfect to heal, uh, let's say, a solo Terracotta Sentinel. This becomes much less useful when you have multiple single entities in the same area. So if I'm flying in four Sky Junks supported by four Terracotta Sentinels, and then I'm also running in there for a fight, then this spell is crap because I'm paying 18 to heal only one of them by 44%, let's say. Or I can spend four, right? Once we get upgraded, four Winds of Magic to heal all nine units. We described it, four Terracotta Sentinel, four Sky Junks, and then Mel Ying. And each of them will get healed uh, this this is seven second, but if we upgrade it, well, I guess the overcast, right? Seven second, five point six percent, five point six percent times nine units, same value, about forty five percent of their health. And since the cooldown solo, I can spam this, and I can trigger multiple life bloom rather than just one life bloom when casting. So I can get four cast this four times. Every single one of my units will heal about 20% versus casting this once and one of my units heal 40%. Right? So it's it's great when you're only interested in healing one thing. So if your army composition is just mailing going in there to do all the damage and she needs the heal and everything else is, let's say, Celestial Dragon Guard, Celestial Dragon, Crossbowmen, those are terrible healing because per model, you can't heal a dead person. Right? If it's, you know, 160 peasant long spearmen you fought a bunch you have 82 of them left 82 of them can go to full health but you can't create an 83rd person the so healing on units with multiple entities is less efficient on healing with single entities so this is great when you're only running like a few single entities in the army that needs heal if you're running multiple single entities if you're designing your army to run multiple single entities then just stick to earth blood so much cheaper more triggers of life bloom and just more efficient. Now, Talons of Night is different. This is a big damage spell you have. There's a 15 meter radius. It causes a vortex. All these cool dragon claws comes out. Shadow damage, 100% armor piercing, magic damage, you know, 110 damage over that 11 seconds. It's really nice, All right? This is actually a super nice spell, in my opinion. It costs quite a bit, right? It goes up to 18 costs for the overcast if you get the minus three if you don't get the minus three it's it's 21 for the basic upgraded version i think it's cheaper for the basic version but we can't see it here unless i i can't hover in both places um it, it's around it's above 10 it's from my memory um it's still expensive relatively speaking but the damage is good uh so i would recommend getting this so if we're interested in doing overcast and we're running single entity armies, the four points that you would consider would just be two points of talents tonight, earthing, magical reserve, arcane conduit. If you're not interested in ever overcasting, then magical reserve, one point talent knight, one point regrowth, another point talent knight, four points, pick up arcane conduit. Up to you. All right, and then the fifth roll here for our units. 
This is the least important in my opinion. Uh, you probably want to pick this up when you have your army setup decided in case you change your mind, right? And you already have points invested and you're like, I don't want this army. Then, you know, what do I do with these bonuses? That's not applicable to my own Lord's army. And in essence, you want to consider a lot of factors. In our case, we're playing as Mel Ying. Assuming you're playing as Mel Ying's faction, not that you confederated her, uh, you have bonuses to a lot of range units, extra ammo faction-wide, and for your own army in particular, 50% discount to upkeep for missile infantry. And what is the best missile infantry on launch for Grand Cafe? Celestial Dragon Guards, uh, Dragon Crossbowmen. They're really, really good. Uh, they hold up in melee, they don't die often, most of the damage is armor piercing, and um, they're just strong. So in that case, if you're interested in running army featuring Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen, then this short aim, you want to go all the way up, you want to start with just some increased missile damage, all the way up to 10% additional range and 9% additional damage. Doesn't hurt. If you want to end up a rally, you need 6 points, so we need to find another grouping. Well, what else do you want in your army? We talked about how great she is at healing single entities, so let's look at things like Stone Gaze. We have increased damage for the two single entities that could be possibly fit in an army, Wuxing War Compass, which is also good for increasing the intensity of spells, as they all have this Master of Elemental Wind on them. Uh, but the problem becomes this. We get Leadership Boost on the final two points, and the Terracotta Sentinel is unbreakable. So in my opinion, it's a bit of a waste. And also, Wuxing War Compasses, even though it's a chariot unit, you're never charging that thing into the enemy. It's pretty fragile. It's a magic conduit. So giving it weapon strength, what's the point? So I feel like Stone Gaze is poorly designed. I don't recommend it. I also don't think Terracotta Sentinels really need 12% additional damage. They're fine. Um, they have plenty of damage. So instead of that, I, I recommend Skyfire because Sky Junk is a single entity. Sky Junk is really strong in my opinion. They're just really slow. So you get 15% speed and then additional 12% missile strength. Perfect. Especially right now with the insert aiming bug. I don't know if you guys know, there's additional manual firing. And I think if you're in insert firing mode where you hit insert and you're like first person shooting, it doesn't count the ammo correctly. Like I had instances where basically I fired like five or six shots and it only reduced like three ammo once I came out of the mode, which make sky jump really, really broken. Um, but I think that will get patched, so I'm not recommending it on the basis of that. But overall, Sky Junks are strong. Single entity, great for healing, and giving them more speed to relocate to different angles, keep them safe, spin around using your crane gunners for damage, dropping those uh, bombs from their base, which require you to fly over the enemy. Very, very useful overall. So I would just go with short aim, three points, sky fire, three points. I don't care about the melee boost for the infantry. Like. I'm not going to recruit any infantry for this army. It's going to be single entity for the melee component to get the Inyan bonus. I'll have like maybe ideal army in my mind is four Terracotta Sentinels, four Sky Junks, maybe eight Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen. That's 16 units. My Lord, that's 17. Last three slots, it's pretty flexible. You could put more heroes in there. So you can get like an Astromancer, get an Alchemist, use their... Mastery of Arcane, uh, Mastery of Elemental Winds to boost your Lord, uh, or you can fit in a couple of the Loma uh, Cavalry if you want to do some chase down different angles. But I think Cavalry in general are pretty weak, so you could just be flexible with your final three slots. Um, you can even pull out a couple of Wuxian War Compass just to improve your spell damage if you want, but maybe some foreign units um, you, if you get good alliances. But the basic core, I think, is just. Get a couple of Terracotta Sentinels, they will be what provides you the young bonus. Have your Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen sit there behind them to get the reload speed bonus from the Yin Yang. And then have your Sky Drunk hover overhead. And that's a really strong army with Mao Ying for healing on top of that. So I think that's solid, six points. Rally on top of that. Just the leadership active ability nearby, very basic. This can be upgraded to different skill at the bottom here, stand your ground. It replaces Rally. It adds 24 points of melee defense on top of the 16 point leadership. As we mentioned, melee defense is really good. This is really worth it, which means we need one point in these four. And there's a really good one here, Fast Hands. Because we're 
said earlier, we're going to run eight Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen. We're giving them 10% more reload skill, and we're also giving them 15% missile resistance. I think this is the best one. Uh, this is leadership and charge bonus for your melee units. This is just speed and physical resistance for single entities and your cavalry. Um, you could argue that Terracotta Sentinel with 10% physical resistance plus 10% speed is not terrible, but that's the only benefit there. I I don't, I mean, if I have a choice between boosting range unit versus boosting melee unit, I always boost the range unit because I'm not trading health for damage. I'm getting free damage, right? I'm shooting 10% faster. I can get more shots in as they run up to me. And the missile resistance, you know, I if the enemy range unit park in front of that, which happens a lot and trade fire with my units, I'm going to do fairly better against them. Um, Looming Lantern also looks a bit attractive. Uh, but it's very defensive stat focus for your sky junk. And while that might be important, if we're just spamming heal on our single entities, they're going to be fine. We don't need the 15% missile resistance. And finally, pick up stand your ground. So fast hand into stand your ground. Now, the last role here is probably the least useful role on this list. Uh, the reason being is just the only thing useful is route melcher. This would be always your rank two pickup, right? Quality of life bonus. You already have earth blood. Right, you don't need to pick up Earth Blood second when you hit rank two. Just pick up Route Marcher, uh, Route Marcher, uh, five percent campaign movement range. You cannot complain about that. That's always a good thing to have. So that's your first level up, pretty much every game. And then I would pick up Earth Blood, Life Bloom, Power of In. So rank two, rank three, rank four, rank five, rank six. Save up six points. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, and then work on the rest of your spell, uh, build it up. Uh, once you get evasion, you could stop. I don't think these are that important. Oh, actually, it's not that important, but it's still important. Like magical reserve is pretty good. Maybe pick up magical reserve and then try to get arcane condo as so you probably wouldn't need thing. But then you gotta decide like, are we overcasting? Or are we not? If we're overcasting, then just go for it and start picking up more points here. If we're not, then we're flipping. We're flipping back to you know, hard to hit and just completing these to get ourselves stronger. Because at this point, you know, rank 12, you don't have the units. You don't have the Terracotta Sentinels. You don't have that recruitment. You don't have more Sky Junk recruitment. You don't have Celestial Dragon Warriors. So there's no point coming down here until you have those. So this can wait. And then finally, this can really wait. In the end, your choice is like, if I love overcasting, I can give up this roll. It's fine. Just go back to your magic and just pick up every single point and just overcast to your heart content. If I want to make Melian super strong, I don't care if it's just another 30 points of charge bonus. I want that. Go get it. Just skip this roll here. You save so many points, right? Just this roll alone, like this is 12, 13, and this is another 12. So that's another 13, 26 points. You, you have to give up 49 skill points. If you give up these 26 points, you only have to give up about 20 something from above and you're ready going to give up. You know, you're not going to pick up all the unit bonuses. There's four of them you're not going to pick up. That's another 12, so you're at 38. So you only have to skip 11 up here, right? Skip 10, skip 9, skip 8. So you're pretty well set, right? I'm not picking up these three as well, so that's skip 5, right? So there's things you can easily master everything up here if you give up the last roll, but let's see why we are giving it up, right? These campaign bonuses, not that important. They're only going to apply to your local region. If we're not going to give it up, what should we get, right? Do I want irrepressible? Well, no, that's the honest answer because we're so good at healing. Why do we care about after combat replenishment? I can stand on the battlefield as the enemy are routing away and just spam earth blood on myself and I can come out of the fight full heal. Why, why do I care about this? This will never be useful. And then the final one, sure, 6% upkeep. It's nice. It's not important. You built your economy well, this is not useful. Starting rank, it's a okay bonus, but it's not game changing. Local re recruitment could be useful, but do you really want to waste this final skill point or just so many skill points to get to that point? A million, just so that you can recruit an army when your army is probably already fully recruited by the time you pick up this skill, right? So these are really questionable ones to get if you invest so many in these boxes here. And uh, lightning strike, it's good. Uh, being able to shut down enemy reinforcement armies, but I don't think it's game changing. Uh, if you use your spells well, if you have a good army set up, bring a second army if, if it's that tough. But overall, I, I don't think there's any situation where this would 
help you that much to justify investing that many points. Things that might be considered useful, if you're thinking about marching out to some really bad chaos wasteland where the climate is just super unsuitable and your army is expected to get hit with attrition, then reducing that is important. There are buildings in Grand Bastion that can help you reduce it, and you can add this on top of that, and that can keep you healthy when you're traveling in some dangerous land. But the game doesn't force you to travel in those lands, so not a must-have. Reducing corruption is always good, but you don't need Melgen to be standing everywhere to be reducing corruption, right? Have more options. You have the Wuxing Compass mechanic to reduce corruption, so you don't have to get this. Don't be cheap on units. If you're not being cheap on, you know, a bunch of buildings, don't be cheap on units. Uh, control, mm, not that important. So that's why we're giving those up. Lightning Strike's the only one that can argue is like, that's pretty good. Upkeep, upkeep is better than uh, recruitment. That's, that's definitely true. But uh, like I said, fix your economy, build your army smart. You know, if we have 50% discount for missile infantry, then try to build a lot of celestial dragon crossbowmen. They're good. And you get 50%, which gives them incredible value. Replenishment, less useful because we're running more single entities. We have a lot of heal. So post-battle replenishment, less of a thing for us. Alert, um, just be alert when you're ending your turn and uh, you should be fine. And that's pretty much the skill tree guide. We want to build our character into a strong duelist with some nice faction-wide bonuses, or not faction-wide, but army bonuses for our Lord's Army, specializing in more range, specializing in more single entity, having means to heal them, having means to protect them with things like missile mirrors, giving them physical resistance on top, and just making ourselves strong. That can be cast on ourselves. Uh, we have one really good damage ability. That's it. Mostly we're a healer. And that's really how you should approach it. Now, you could have many things in the army setup to build up El Master of Elemental Wind, but it also works vice versa. Just because we're not a good damage dealer, you don't have to force it. Like, we don't have to be the one dishing out spell damage in that army. If you're running some sort of alchemist, you're running some sort of astromancer, you know, lore of heaven, lore of metal, those have good options too. And you can be passing on your Master of Elemental Wind to increase their intensity as well. So don't force things when they're not really designed for you. Not saying Vortex is bad, right? This is definitely a good mob clear. If you get them all clumped up, this is wonderful, but uh, that's your only real damaging ability here. So you're more of a duelist and a healer, and you should build you know, as such. You have bonuses for missile infantry, build as such. And because we're a healer, build more single entities. And that's pretty much it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this guide, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!